you're reminding me to record. Thank you. Um, all right, so we're going to finish uh, last time's lecture. In just a few slides, as I said. Um, skeletal, um, appendicular skeletal, okay. I'm just going to share my <coughs> PowerPoint rather than uploading, otherwise it's going to take forever to upload all the lectures. All right, so um, we were kind of um, down here, right? Uh, did we talk about the femur at all, the lower limb? I remember. Did we uh, did we watch the video about femur? This one over here, the link over here. We didn't. Somebody says yes. Somebody says no. <laughs> so we did. Okay. So we kind of finished it. Um, again, just a few um, a few of the features of this bone uh, to remember. Of course, if um, if if uh, we were doing a real lab, you know, this probably these things would um, be natural for you to remember. So try to watch the videos and try to also do uh, your AMP, uh, your uh, mastering activities. That should help you remember all the features. Okay, but you can't miss something like um, my pen. Something like the head, okay? And you see how, oops, see how round is this head, okay? It's like a ball, okay? It reminds you of the ball and socket type of uh, synovial joint. So that's exactly what it is, that joint, okay? And where does it fit into, okay? You should know where uh, this one uh, fits into, what is called that cavity. Uh, that it fits into that part of the. Um, let's see, there is some answer. Somebody. We need somebody answered. Very good. Okay. The acetabulum that accepts this one. So, um, so again, you know, things are all interconnected, and especially when you when we talk about bones. Uh, the most important thing is always the articulation point. Uh, I think we were just we just looked very briefly at the patella, but the patella is a very sm a small and simple bone. It's a sesamoid bone, uh, meaning that uh, it's pendant and it's, um, it develops into a um, tendon, which is shown over here. It's, it's uh, um, function is to protect the knee to kind of uh, provide an extra little protection for that uh, knee joint that's so uh, such a delicate important joint okay so um did we look at the leg at all probably not anyways even if we did i'm just gonna meet okay so the leg is composed by the tibia and the fibula and um the tibia is the bigger bone, is the medial one, and the fibula is the lateral bone. Important uh, feature is the inter interosseous membrane. Get my pen, okay. Very important. And remember, we did find this type of membrane also in the arm, didn't we? Okay, the two. Bones of the forearm also have this feature. We kind of keep the bones in position. They articulate, um, they articulate superiorly and inferiorly, and this is a point of articulation. So this is the superior tibiofibular joint, and this is the inferior tibiofibular joint. Does it make sense? Um, when we look at uh, uh, tibia, tibia is the bone that really receives all the weight from uh, from the femur. 
um, and uh, fibula does not really uh, does not bring um, any weight on it. Okay, so this is the more important of the two bones, and um, we can recognize condyles over here at the uh, superior or proximal epiphysis. Here, this is the medial condyle, and this is the lateral condyle. Now, these condyles here, the, these points are for attachment of muscles, but then the surfaces over here are the surfaces of um, interaction and uh, joining away the, the femur. Uh, this bump over here is called the tibial tuberosity. What is it going to be for? It's a tuberosity on a bone. What did I tell you in general? All these tuberosities or these lines are mostly 95% of the cases, I want to say, at least. They're for attachment or what? Can somebody speak it? Muscle. Muscular attachment, okay, very good. So you cannot go wrong, okay? Especially tuberosities, okay? Uh, sometimes the name helps you, okay? And um, sometimes they're called prominence, sometimes they're called spines too. So, but the word tuberosity is always for muscle. Um, here we can recognize two other features, which are the malleoli, the medial and the lateral malleoli. They're not on the same bone. The medial is on the tibia, which is the medial bone, and the lateral is on the fibula. Because, I mean, these two bones are considered kind of like, um, they're always looked at together, okay, because they are uh, associated and uh, they're joined um, in the lower leg. All right, so I pretty much already told you everything. I told you about the tibial tuberosity. Um, so this is for attach attachment of muscle quadriceps. I'm not going to ask you about muscles, muscle names, okay? Also, the patellar tendon actually attaches here. So that's a very important point, okay? Uh, condyles, I told you, and... Um, Okay, so we're gonna um, now watch the video. I have a video about, uh, I think it's just about the tibia. And uh, the link is over here for you. So let's see what the guy here tells us, if he tells us anything more. Okay, so. Long tab, TV, share audio, share audio. There you go. As always, we start off with laterality, trying to figure out if this is left or right, using our markings to help us. First and foremost, the portion that seems looks like a kind of like top of the golf tee would be considered the condyles and you'll notice these condyles have wonderful facets that allow us to articulate with our femur in between these condyles are a large intercondylar eminence as you can see this large large ridge here so this is what we would term the intercondylar eminence this is always proximal closest to the body so in our body if we if you are the body this is closest to you that's the far distal end there and so we have this intercondylar eminence with the two condyles medial and lateral uh, both having facets in which we are able to articulate with the femur again. Okay, so if we have the proximal, what else do we need? Well, we need what's medial and lateral. And so as we take a look down here, you'll notice a little point which we call the medial malleolus. And by the name, hopefully it gives you the actual direction that we're looking for. That's called the medial side, of course. Medial. A lot of people were like, oh, it's a stylet process. It's not a stylet process. It's too thick to be a stylet process. And so we call it a malleolus. So this is the medial malleolus. So now, of course, the medial malleolus. There's not a lateral one that's on a different bone. This is the medial malleolus being medial. Kind of strange to say it that way, but that's the way it's it lays itself out. So here we are with proximal. This is medial. Now we just got to figure out if it's anterior posterior because then in our body, if this is you, uh, towards your body, this is proximal. And uh, if this is medial, then they would face on this side. If it's medial on this side, if this is anterior, then this is medial here. So 
One of the easiest ways to see this large, large marking called the tibial tuberosity in which our quadriceps tendon will attach to. And so this is the tibial tuberosity. And so intercondylar eminence, some condyles with the tibial, tibial tuberosity being anterior. So that's anterior. And so, of course, now if this is anterior. This is facing forward. This would, of course, be my right tibia, right tibia, because, of course, now keeping this proximal to you, this mean medial facing the midline, and of course, now this tibial tuberosity being anterior, voila, you have a right tibia. Some other structures, uh, a couple lines on the posterior side, you see this little line that cuts across this way. This is called the um, popliteal line, also known as the soleal line, so people name it that way, but more likely it's the popliteal line because it's found behind the knee. The regional term is called popliteus or popliteal, so the muscle popliteus will attach there, as well as soleus would, and that's why they Mix those up. That's okay. Uh, so let's review. So we have our two condyles with their facets because we know this is medial. This is the medial condyle of uh, tibia. This is the lateral condyle of the tibia. In between is the intercondylar eminence. On the anterior surface is a large big bump called the tibial tuberosity. And then the line behind it is the popliteal line or soleal line. And then way down here we have the large medial malleolus. Okay, so uh, the the few other um, details that I told you, uh, don't worry about it. Just um, stick to what it's on my uh, PowerPoint, okay? But I think it gave you a nice overview of the bone. And uh, you can touch your malleoli. Right now, I want you to touch your ankle. Whatever sticks out on each side of your ankle, is the malleolus okay on each side touch them mine are so i can feel them really well and i can see them kind of annoying uh okay so um all right um let me share my powerpoint again share uh I think we're done with the leg and now we're going to look at the foot uh, briefly okay so uh foot is pretty um, easy because i'm not gonna ask you to remember really all the names of the bone of the uh, tar tarsus so uh, like the hand a uh, foot is divided into portions. portion there is the tarsus the metatarsus and then the phalanges okay and the bones of the tarsus are the tarsals Okay, tarsal is the bone, tarsus is the region. Uh, metatarsus is the region and metatarsals are the bones. Okay, and then there are the phalanges, just like in the hand. And, um, and so there are several bones uh, that we recognize um, in, the tarsum, in the tarsus. And um, the biggest one is the calcaneus. Okay, this is uh, the bone on which pretty much uh, uh, is is the um, has a, a, a big uh, tuberosity, uh, and this that's here um, is the, is what actually touches the ground. Okay, okay? and um, so as we will see in the next slide, which is really the most important thing I want you to remember is there is an arch here. Not all the bones should really touch ground, other than the calcaneus and um, here your uh, phalanges and uh, as we will see there are arches recognized in the foot and that's how a good foot a, a perfectly functioning foot should be um, so that it forms like a, it acts like a ring okay um, that um, it doesn't bring all the uh, weight down on it all right so we're going to look at that in the next slide so um the calcaneus maybe is the only one uh, I'm going to actually ask you to remember is the biggest one, okay? And don't worry about the names of all the others of the tarsus. Remember, there are seven of them. Um, these articulate, um, a, a row of these articulate uh, uh, distally with the metatarsus, which are five, and are, num are numbered from one to five with no Roman numbers, just like uh, in the hand. And um, and um, from the allox to the little toe, okay, they are numbered one to five. 
Uh, and then and this articulate um, distally with the phalanges. And uh, again, the phalanges, we found 14 bones uh, total. And for the digit one, the hallux, we only have two uh, phalanges. And for the others, we have three. And these are, the, of course, the proximal, the distal, and then in between here is the medial. Okay, so same thing. Okay, pretty simple, I guess, to remember. Now, um, the foot, again, in the foot, we can recognize arches. Okay, see how uh, this is uh, the, this is one point and this is the other point at which uh, we should have, we should touch the ground, really. And everything in between should really be um, in the arch. And this is uh, these arches in a you know well formed um, foot, or let's say maybe in a young also in a young foot, uh, you can see this very well. Uh, there are two arches, two are long, uh, sorry three arches, two are longitudinal and one is actually transversal. Let me get another. Um, I wanted to get a different color to show you. This was uh, this one. Okay, is transversal goes this way, while the other two are longitudinal. Again, these arches are very important because they uh, make the uh, foot uh, function as a spring, um, and so um, these um, so so the foot is able to bear all the weight of the body and absorb the shock that is produced during walking, during locomotion, during running, and um, <clears throat> And so with, um, what happens is that if you, especially if you don't wear proper shoes throughout life, this arch may um, kind of disappear or ameliorate uh, uh, as you age. And so your walking becomes much, much more difficult uh, at a later age. Or some, um, in some children, it's observed that this arch is not formed very well, but you can correct is by wearing specific types of shoes okay so um something can be uh can be corrected when it comes to bones you know you know there is a lot of correction that we can do there better because there is a lot of uh, remodeling as well all right so i'm done with this and now i'm going to start opening all the lectures starting from tissues remember that we couldn't finish the tissues in our um, unit one. So this is going to be part of the test, all right? Uh, so uh, we uh, talked about connect tissues and um, there are three major types of connective tissues. Um, there is the connective tissue proper, connective tissue proper, there is supporting connective tissue, and then there is the fluid. What's the fluid one? It's blood, okay? That's it. Um, for a connective tissue proper, we uh, have to distinguish between loose and dense connective tissue. What is the loose one? The loose one is loose, so it's less fibers and more ground substance, the dense and more fibers. And because we have uh, several different types of loose we have to do a subclassification in areola are adipose and tular. for the dense we have regular irregular and elastic we didn't really look at elastic okay so we looked at regular and irregular remember these are the stacks of lasagna the irregular um, are the fettuccine in your plate so um and then uh, we looked at cartilage and bone so for this uh, presentation, I'm going to actually skip cartilage and bone because I'm going to open up the presentation where we specifically talk about bone. See here, everything is connected. Many things overlap. When you see all these, all these PowerPoints, don't get overwhelmed because so many things are the same thing that we talked about. Okay, We just talked about from a different point of view, but it's the same exact material. I don't know what you guys are saying because I am in presentation mode. Let me see. There are a few comments. Let me go back. Um, 
Um, okay, so uh, Brianna, he's talking so fast. Who's talking? I'm talking too fast. Yeah, but I was just referring um, when you were when you were playing that video, talking about the bones. He was just like speaking a million miles a minute. So <laughs> I was just commenting on. That. Yeah, I I may be talking fast today too because I want to you know cover as much as possible in the review. Um, too much material for the test? Well, just think about this. There should have been more. <laughs> there should have been the muscular tissue in this unit, and you don't have it. So at least be grateful about that. Guys, this course is what it is. You know, this is human anatomy. This is. If you don't get crazy now, you're good. You're good for life. Okay, I'm telling you. When I did human anatomy, I really thought I would go crazy when I was in college. Anyways, yeah, it's a lot of material, I know. So, um, what was I saying? Uh, guys, if you have comments, can you talk? Because I'm in presentation mode and I can't see what's going on there in terms of uh, comments. If you have a question, can you please uh, uh, talk about it? Otherwise, I have to go back and forth. It takes, you know, it, we waste time. So, um, okay, so let's review briefly this, basically, the art. Then we're going to talk about cartilage and bone in the chapter of cartilage and uh, of uh, bone, basically, skeletal uh, tissue. And the blood, I mean, I really, I don't have anything to tell you about that. It's just the only type of fluid tissue. Now, where do we find connective tissue? Everywhere, under the skin, there is the adipose tissue. Uh, in the bones, it's called connective tissues and uh, tissue, and um, of course, also part of the skin. Okay, this member skin, and we're going to talk about uh, review this today. Is the dermis, is the epidermis, and the dermis. The dermis is formed by a certain type of connective tissue. Okay, so we're going to talk about that again. Blood, of course, function, support, and protect. Um, and um, these a few slides that I'm going to uh, open up are super important. You cannot not know what is the connective tissue made of. It's made of a lot of matrix and cells, of course. And in the matrix, you find fibers and ground substance. Okay, these are definitions. These are concepts you cannot skip from knowing. Okay. I'm telling you there are going to be questions in the test. These are the, your theoretical questions. Like, I may not give you a picture here to recognize. This is a question. What, is, what are the components of connective tissue? So um, fibers, we have different types of fibers. We're going to review them. Ground, tissue, ground substance is mostly a watery material. Uh, which uh, contains a lot of um, um, or, a lot of organic molecules as well, uh, like um, uh, glycoproteins, a lot of sugars. It almost becomes like a gelatinous uh, consistency. Uh, becomes a gelatinous because of all these small uh, molecules in it. Okay, uh, and um, and so take it. Let's take a look at the various cells as well as. The, um, various types of fibers uh, that are present in connective tissue. Fibroblast is the predominant type of cell. And uh, of course, when it comes to specific types of connective tissue, such as bone and cartilage, there are specific cells that, there that I didn't present here because they are unique. And you should know about those cells because, of course, we talked about them when talked about connective uh, when we talked about cartilage and uh, bone respectively and we're going to recall them okay? so fibroblasts are predominant cells but you also find lots of uh, defensive type of cells in um, all connective tissues there are macrophages mast cells monocytes as well I, and I don't have them here but there's another possible one um, and of course red and, and white cells are fine in blood and adipocytes they're typical of they're very unique right they're typical of the adipose connective type of tissue uh, regarding the fibers uh, collagen fibers are the number one you cannot not remember this for me otherwise I don't see how you can pass Okay, collagen is so important. Um, and then we have the reticular fibers and the elastic ones. 
And in some types of uh, connect tissue, you have more of the elastic ones, okay, rather than the collagen ones. So the collagen ones are always the, there, and then they can be additional ones such as the reticular and the elastic ones. And uh, they look different, okay? For, for instance, the collagen ones are more straight. The reticular are, they form like a reticulum, like a net, okay? And the elastic are kind of wavy, okay? So that's how you recognize them. Uh, we talked about the various types of loose connective tissue, okay? Areolar, remember, areolar, look at, uh, think about air, think about air uh, bubbles. Uh, this is this looks like your bubble bra okay with lots of um or the function at least is like a, a bubble bra because it really cushions and protects uh, um protects the structures in the body so uh, it's uh, this is very widely distributed for instance under the epithelia in the packages organs it surrounds capillaries so it's very widespread uh, wide widespread <laughs> type of connect tissue, okay, areolar. And um, we find a lot of fibroblasts, of course, macrophages, and, um, and uh, of course, collagen fibers in there. Uh, whenever you see an histology, what is this? What is this thing? What is this thing? This is a real histology. What are those black, not black, dark staining, round, Thing is, those are blood they, vessels. Say it again, sorry. Say it again. Can you say it? You're breaking up. I can't hear. I can't understand what you're saying. Can you say it again? Did you write it? I have to go back in order to see what you wrote. Are we still connected? Nuclei, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jose. Okay, so nuclei, very good. Okay, these are the nuclei of the cells, okay? You can't uh, really miss them. Uh, all right, so you see how uh, here um, there are really densely packed uh, fibers here. The fibers are quite uh, dispersed. The most abundant part of this um, um, here, of this type of uh, uh, tissue is the, really the, the ground substance, okay? Everything in between uh, the cells and the fibers, okay? If you take away the fibers and the cells, you have a lot of that ground substance here everywhere, okay? That's more predominant. Um, okay, then we have the adipose uh, tissue, loose connective tissue which um, has lots of the, uh, packed cells. All these cells are packed, they look like marshmallow. And uh, the nuclear is smashed, they're funny kind of in a way, because the nuclear is smashed on the periphery of the cell. Most of the cell cytoplasm is pretty much gone, and you have a, a big blob of fat occupying the cell, okay? That's how they look like in real histology. They look like marshmallow, okay? So you cannot go wrong, okay? And of course, adipose tissue, where do you find it? Under the skin, okay? Mostly. Uh, but also um, around uh, organs such as kidneys. Uh, and of, of course, there is a lot of fat tissue also in bone, remember? So pretty much uh, everywhere within abdomen, of course, some people, uh, some people have more fat tissue than others. Uh, then we have the reticular loose connective tissue. Looks like a reticulum. Uh, this is a very spe special type of tissue. It's found mostly is found mostly in lymphoid organs. For instance, remember for me the spleen. Okay, spleen is um, that kind of uh, organ where you can this, um, you find this kind of tissue. If you section the spleen, you will see how. It is spleen is a very spongy type of um, organ because of the presence of this uh, uh, type of tissue. All right, then we talked about the dense. Remember, this regular looks like the, uh, the lasagna noodles, stack of lasagna noodles. 
where all the all the fibers are stacked in parallel, whereas the irregular, which is also a lot of fibers, is your noodles. Okay, your uh, your tagliatelle uh, in the plate. Okay. And so that's exactly how it looks like. This, um, this is the dense regular connective tissue. Where do we find this one? In tendons, ligaments. Think about those tissues that have all these fibers packed very nicely in the same direction, very parallel to one another. Uh, of course, here the, the main type of cell is the fibroblast. Uh, and of course, the, the type of fibers are collagen. Okay, I told you finding tendons, ligaments. The dense irregular uh, one um, is found mainly in the dermis of the skin. I'm telling you it here. And when we talk about skin, I'm going to tell you again. Okay, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. If you learn it now, you know it already when you study skin. So um, these are irregularly arranged uh, fibers. It's the same thing as the regular one, but the fibers are kind of like irregularly disposed like your tagliatelle. All right, so dense regular versus irregular. As I told you, I'm going to kind of skip, um, well, I'm going to uh, basically just go over the hyaline fiber cartilage and uh, elastic cartilage. And then uh, definitely I'm going to talk about bone right in this one because we talk about it more in detail um, in the, the introduction of the skeletal system. See how many things overlap. It's less material than you think because we talked about bone here. We talked about, uh, we saw some histology in this presentation as an introduction. And then we talked, and I showed you the same images and I talked about the same things when we talked about introduction to the skeletal system, there are many things that overlap, okay? So if you know it now, you have learned it now, you don't have to memorize things again um, for the, uh, when, when the skeletal, introduction to skeletal comes. All right, so let's look at, um, very quickly at uh, various types of cartilage. The hyaline one is uh, very important. Um, has an amorphous type of matrix. You almost can't see the fibers here. You can They're almost uh, they're almost unperceivable. The type of cells that we find in here, they are located in holes. How do we call the uh, call these holes that are present in cartilage and in bone? We call them lacuna. You learn it now. You already know it when we go look at um, bones. Um, because, of course, uh, being these uh, types of tissues so hard, the cells themselves would be smashed if there weren't spaces, holes, in which they can be accommodated. And so you see how this um, looks like in real histology. All these are lacunae, and inside of them there are the cells, okay? And uh, these are the chondrocytes, the type of cells that are typical of uh, uh, cartilage. Uh, this type of cartilage uh, serves as a, a cushion, okay, because it, it is able to resist compressive uh, stress. I want you to start uh, touching your nose right now. Touch your nose. Can't you feel like a cushion? Touch the tip of your nose and try to compress that. It kind of like uh, goes back and forth, like you have a pillow that you're smashing back and forth. A cushion, right? That's, that's, uh, um, that's the function of this type of cartilage. And uh, we find it in specific places. For instance, where do you need this cushioning? You need this cushioning in the uh, epiphysis of bones where there is articulation between bones. You need a cushion there. You, do, you need a cushion, a cu another cushion, another cushion. You really need backups here. Otherwise, you risk that that articulation doesn't function anymore or it hurts really bad. Okay? So in the articular cartilage here uh, of uh, bones, you can find uh, this hailing cartilage. And um, other places are, for instance, um, here in the connection between uh, uh, ribs and sternum, also in larynx, okay? But remember your nose, okay? Touch your nose 
and um, you will feel that cushioning. Fibrocartilage um, is, uh, uh, ha has more obvious fibers, okay, in it, more fibers and less cells, okay? And um, this is uh, also, you know, the, the, the function here is also to uh, absorb compressive shock, but it's where there is more uh, of this compressive shock happening. For instance, in the intervertebral disc, it makes sense, okay, that maybe the uh, hailing will be too weak. It's too, uh, you know, you don't want like something that smashes down like a pillow in between the vertebrae. Otherwise, it could be problematic. You want something a little bit stronger there. So that's where you, therefore, you have the fibrocartilage, which has more fibers. Um, still absorb compressive shock, but it's not as cushion, a cushioning as um, as the hailing. Okay, and so you find it here. Remember here, but also in the menisci, which are um, these uh, discs that additional, again additional features, especially found in the knee, which is a very very um, very. Um, uh, it's a very um, important type of uh, articulation because uh, that's where a lot of the weight of the body really arrives there. So it makes sense that you have additional features there, not only just uh, not just the, um, the uh, articular cartilage, not the just a, a synovial cavity, but uh, even other um, other additional features there to announce that um, cushioning and to maintain the, um, the actual joint active and uh, uh, functioning throughout life. Okay, so another one is the elastic cartilage. Now I want you to touch your ear, and if you have not studied, I want you to pull your ears, okay, and feel how you can extend them. You can, you can extend Right, pull it, pull it right now, and pull it more if you haven't studied. And uh, this is because there are elastic fibers there that make you like uh, really extend it. Okay, so remember it's found in the ear mostly. Okay, um, as I said, I will not uh, go through the bone because um, we're going to open that specific uh, um, lecture. Blood is just one thing, and maybe one question about the blood. And uh, as I told in my previous group, <clears throat> don't worry about remembering muscle tissue function and also um, the virus types because we're going to repeat everything next. Uh, as we uh, introduce the, uh, the muscular system, we're going to repeat everything. Okay, so skip it. All right, I'm not going to give you any questions about it right now. Are going to be part of unit three but you have to know about the body membranes also don't worry too much about um, this slide okay i'm not going to give you any questions about this right now because we have an entire pretty much half of the, uh, our semester upcoming and we're going to talk about the nervous tissue so you will know that very well soon all right so re regarding the body membranes remember that we here define the body all the types of body membranes, you kind of have to know this, all right? We, we define the mu mucous membranes. We had already defined the serous membranes um, previously. Uh, then we talked about the cutaneous membrane, which is basically skin, and the synovia membranes. Again, we pretty much touched on this already in previous uh, lectures. Um, and um, the ones that we didn't really talk about are the mucous ones. We talked about them in this instance. These are membranes that line um, the structures or organs that are in contact with the exterior uh, environment, such as, for instance, the respiratory system, the digestive. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense, the reproductive, that uh, there is an extra layer that is produced there, usually is a mucus that is produced because of the presence of mucus glands, okay? Think about when you uh, breathe a lot of dust and you tend to form these uh, 
mucous material that at some point uh, your body really wants to get rid of. So you may cough and you produce this uh, mucous material that uh, maybe uh, is, uh, looks dirty because maybe you have been uh, in a very dusty environment and you're bleeding and things like that. So it happens to everybody, right? So it makes you understand how important is that because uh, that mucus has a role of entrapping all these particles that otherwise would really go on your tissues and in contact with your cells. You don't want that, okay? Um, and so these um, uh, examples of mucous membranes found in mouth, nose, bronchi, okay? Um, regarding the uh, serous membranes, remember there are the, um, these are lining the dorsal and the ventral body cavities, okay, that we already talked about. And, um, and the dorsals are, um, the dorsal are the cranial and the uh, um, vertebral cavity, which, con which contain a brain and the spinal cord. And the ventral body cavities are um, several. Um, for instance, let's look at, um, first let's look at, uh, recall, um, these um, membranes. Uh, so we talk about uh, um, cavity, and the cavity is is uh, uh, really delimited by the membrane. And uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the serous membranes, we have to distinguish in two portions. There is the portion that um, surrounds the organ is the visceral one, and then there is the a portion that is outside the parietal, uh, is the wall. And then in between, remember, there is always a liquid here, which is the serous uh, fluid. And we can recognize these uh, structures um, in pretty much all the serous, uh, um, the serous cavities and the serous membranes. So uh, these um, membranes have specific names, um, the ones that, line specific organs. For instance, the one um, that lines the lung is the pleura. And of course, you have the parietal and the visceral pleura here. Then uh, there is the pericardial, cardium is heart. So uh, there is the parietal and the visceral one, uh, the visceral pericardium. And then there is the peritoneum. The peritoneum is the one that um, surrounds your uh, digestive system. And so, of course, there is the, uh, the parietal uh, and the viscera. All right, so they kind of like need to know these names. And then the cutaneous one is the skin. We're going to look at the skin, okay? And then uh, we have the synovial membranes. These are unique. They're finding joints, right? and they contain the synovial fluid. Of course, their function is to uh, push and protect um, these joints, right? And um, I gave you some exercises to do. Some of these slides may come in the test, okay? All right, now, what time is it? 11.38, let's go on the integumentary system, okay, briefly. Um, the it's a system made of several organs, such as uh, skin and um, uh, skin appendages. Uh, these are also known as accessory structures. When we talk about an uh, integumentary system, also functions are always super important. Every, every um, new chapter, um, new topic, a new um, organ or organ system, First thing I want you to know is the function, okay? If you don't know the function, that's like uh, the primary thing for me. Um, okay, so there are various functions of the integumentary system. Um, not only, sorry, not only protection, of course, protection from various agents, that these can be uh, or organisms such as bacteria, but also protection against um, uh, radiations, UV light, um, and um, regulation, regulation of temperature, water content, sensation, excretion, okay, excretion of uh, substances, oily substances, or sweat, as you know, 
uh, we're going to talk about. All right, so I'm going to skip on this. And the skin is the largest organ of the body. Okay, this is kind of important. Um, it's a really huge uh, in terms of area that it covers. Um, and when we talk about skin, there are two areas uh, that we recognize, the epidermis and the dermis, okay? Um, let's look at the epidermis first. And unfortunately, you have to know all these layers in the epidermis, they're kind of important, okay? So um, the stratum basale is super important because uh, this is the this is a one layer of cells. This is where all the cells from the subsequent layers up are formed because this is the layer where all the um, cell divisions are happening. See, this is a cell that is dividing. Um, and um, and so they're proliferating, they're dividing, and as they divide, they also move up and form the subsequent layers. Okay, and it's important also to recognize that. Um, so in this uh, um, this layer in stratum basale, besides the skin cells, which are the keratinocytes, you also find another type of cell, which are the melanocytes, which you should very well know what's the function of. What is the function of melanocytes? Briefly, come on, somebody please answer me. Produce color. That color. Okay. All right. So, um, so in the epidermis, we find mostly keratinocytes. These, these are really the cells that form skin. But the melanocytes, which are more rare, okay, are the cells that produce um, these, uh, um, these important molecules, these pigments that make our uh, skin colored. And when they produce these pigments, they um, pass them to the keratinocytes. Okay, the keratinocytes can produce these pigments, um, okay? And um, unfortunately, melanocytes are sometimes the origin, the represent the origin of a very uh, uh, untreatable cancer, melanomas. Melanomas are cancers that originate in these melanocytes. And uh, these melanocytes are very tricky cells because they're able to kind of move around. And that's why when a person has melanoma, if uh, it's even just a little bit uh, advanced, uh, you may already be uh, out of luck because they spread, they move so quickly in the bloodstream and they are able to metastasize very quickly. So it's one of like kind of an untreatable, one of the most untreatable uh, type of uh, cancer. Those malignant real quick. Okay, so we talked about this, remember? Um, and um, so the uh, uh, various other um, layers of the skin are important, are important to recognize. There is a very descriptive, okay? See the stratum granulosum. Remember that these cells basically uh, mostly produce keratin, which is the main protein that forms a, a, a lot of, um, gives a structure to these cells. Now, you may notice that one important difference between a, a, a tissue like this one and the connective tissue is that you see how in this type of tissue there is no almost no matrix right there's almost no matrix uh, but in reality obviously there is a little in between these cells so here there is a little bit of liquid Cells have to always be immersed into a layer of liquid, no matter what, okay? And so there is a little bit, but it's like almost invisible. It's, you know, that matrix that is very abundant in, um, in um, uh, uh, connective tissues here is very scarce, okay? So we don't even talk about. It. And by the way, well, it's indicated here. What are all these things over here? What are these points? What do they represent? Can you speak it? Otherwise, I have to go back and forth. Can somebody answer? 
what do they represent these dots between cells? Junctions, okay, cell junctions. Here it tells you what kind, the desmosomes. All right, I, I cannot go back and forth. It, it just takes too much time. Remember the difference between thin and thick skin is in the stratum corner, which is very thick in thick skin. Okay, this, uh, no matter what kind of skin it is, it sheds constantly. This, uh, uh, this um, uh, layer flakes out. Okay, these are all dead cells anyways. These are ghost cells here. They don't even have a nucleus. They don't stain. You don't see the nuclei here. Do you see any nuclei in here? There are no nuclei anymore. These are dead cells. They're ghost cells filled with keratin. That's what they are, okay? And you have a very thick layer of, in a thick skin. Uh, thick versus thin, again. Okay, that's the, uh, the difference. Um, is uh, uh, the epidermis vascularized? I want immediate answers from all of you. Please. No. What about other no. people? Does anybody say yes? That's correct, okay? No, it's not vascularized but is innervated. The only type of nerve endings are the free nerve endings, something that branches like a tree, doesn't look like a tree, okay? Nerve endings, uh, the only type of nerve uh, endings in the epidermis. Now, when we talk about dermis, it's a different story. Is the dermis vascularized? Yes. Yes, heavily, okay? And also innervated. Now, when we talk about dermis, there are two regions. There is the papillary region and the reticular region. And uh, these two regions uh, present, uh, don't worry too much about this slide, okay? Uh, uh, here it shows you how heavily vascularizes the dermis, the blood vessel, the openings, the, you know, kind of seen throughout this opening. Um, regarding the nervous system, uh, there are different types of nerve terminations, and I'm going to ask you to remember at least these names because, anyways, we're going to look at them again when we look at the nervous system. But if you see something like looking like a cotton candy in a um, epid in the dermis, sorry, that's going to be your Meissner's corpus call, which is mostly a um, touch sensation. And, uh, or, uh, organ, okay, an organ that uh, it, it allows you to feel the touch. And um, another one is the Pacinian or lamellated corpus. It's more like lamellated, okay? Again, you find, you see this thing in the epidermis and you wonder, what is it, okay? It's a nerve termination. And this allows you more to feel pressure, vibration, uh, the other type is the, uh, uh, of nerve termination in the dermis are free nerve endings, the same types that we just described for the epidermis. And then the other one that you need to know about is the root hair plexus. And it's easy because um, it's the only one that wraps around, uh, it's a nerve termination really wraps around the follicle and is able to transmit um, its um, message to this bundle uh, here of uh, muscle, uh, muscle bundle associated with the uh, hair. Does anybody remember what is it called? This is important. Is it a rector pili muscle? Okay. Uh, all right. So it uh, mm -hmm. when you have the goosebumps and there's a, a um, either uh, this is a kind of like when you get goosebumps is an involuntary action where uh, basically um, your hair sticks up right and you and you have bumps that form into your um, onto your skin uh, and the the signal comes from here all right so uh, we talked about appendages of course hair is important one it's pretty complex I know I try to minimize uh, all that. Uh, we're going to look at it uh, again. Exocrine glands are also very important. When you look at a hair, 
I want you to be able to recognize the various areas, okay? Uh, here you have the papilla, then you have the hair bulb, the hair follicle, and the bulge. These are different areas that have different, uh, um, different, uh, the house, let's say, different types of cells. For instance, if I had to ask you, what does the hair bulge house? What kind of cells? This is very specific, remember? There are very important cells in here. What kind of cells are they? Come on, guys, this is important. Anybody? You guys with me? Are you guys there? Yeah. Okay. The hair bulge houses the stem cells. Most of the stem cells of your skin are over here, are in this little bulge, okay? And they're super important, especially when you get uh, damage, a skin damage, a skin cut. The, cell, the stem cells here mobilize and they will um, pretty much um, heal. If there is a wound here, it will heal your wound. So it's very important, a very specific um, function the hair bulb don't confuse it with the hair bulge these are different things okay different and the hair bulb is where your um the cells that are dividing a lot and they're giving rise to all the cells of the hair basically are all in here okay in the hair bulb so very different then there is the hair papilla is also known as dermal papilla okay and um, that's where all your capillaries are coming. Uh, remember that, so as much as there is no blood vessels in the epidermis, there are no blood vessels in the hair itself. They stop here in this uh, invagination, in the dermal or hair papilla. And so it makes sense that the, the cells that uh, divide actively, they need a lot of nutrients and hormones signaling, they're really there very much in contact with the hair papilla okay and so and then we define the hair shaft and the hair root right which is basically all this area the hair shaft starts pretty much here at the uh, epidermis and also goes outside the body all right so we talked about the bulge and uh, we talked about the bulb and the differences we talked about the dermal papilla that contains the blood vessels now, uh, the hair follicle, okay, is uh, this area over here where we can recognize different layers of cells. So we can look at it actually from a cross section and recognize uh, the various uh, the various layers there, okay? Uh, in this section, you can uh, recognize um, the various layers a little bit better. Am I talking? Asking a question or something? No? Okay. Um, all right, so I'm not going to stress too much, okay, to ask you all uh, uh, this uh, external epithelial root sheet and internal epithelial root sheet. There's just too many details. I want you to know uh, these various areas here, okay, more the definition, and I want you to also know one very other important thing. As much as the melanocytes are present in the epidermis, they're also present here, okay? Pretty much at the border uh, between the papilla here and um, the, the, the hair papilla over here and the bulge at the very base and uh, distributed over here. Uh, again, they produce pigmentation that gives the color to your hair. Okay. Was there a question? I heard a beep, but I'm in presentation mode, so I can't see anything right now. Is there a question? No, ma'am. Okay. All right. So, um, see here, it shows you a nice representation of the bulge, the pila, the melanocytes. Um, 
I may I may give you something like this in the test where I mask all the names and I'm going to say A, B, C, D, and maybe you have to record, you have to tell me you know, which is which, you know, you have to match that, something like that, okay? I know it's kind of hard when you see the actual hair, for instance, in this one, yes, you could tell me what this is the, the papilla, right? It's very hard to uh, recognize the melanocytes. I myself may have a uh, may have troubles, okay, to recognize which ones are the melanocytes, unless maybe I go to higher magnification or maybe I'll have to stain uh, the uh, actual section and uh, with different uh, um, types of um, stain that I like them, okay? But you must know they are in this area distributed over here, and that's it. That's the only place where you find them. So the melanocytes are only found here and in the basal layer or the stratum basale of the epidermis. That's it, okay? That's where you find them. All right, so um, again, this is a beautiful image of a hair. It shows very well the dermal papilla, okay? The hair bulb and, um, and the follicle itself. All right, very important is the rector Pili or pili over here. Uh, this is a bundle of uh, muscle tissue that is responsible for uh, when you get the so-called uh, goosebumps. Okay. All right. So function of hair, uh, sensing, guarding, shielding, and protecting. And importantly, you have to know that hair goes through a cycle. No matter what kind of hair it is, a hair grows. Okay, goes through a growth phase then goes into a transition phase and a resting phase and eventually falls off, okay? Don't worry about remembering all these terms, okay? But at least you have to recognize this a process where eventually dies out because it disconnects from the papilla. So it doesn't receive, the follicle doesn't receive the nutrients from the papilla anymore. And therefore, um, pretty much uh, the cells die out and uh, eventually the hair falls off. All right, so we also watched, I think, a video right here, so you can watch it again. And we talked about glands. Uh, there are two types of glands here, um, the sebaceous gland and the sudoriferous or sweat glands. The sebaceous glands are very recognizable, these huge cells here this form these huge clusters. You can see them in uh, a longitudinal or cross-section here. And uh, this produce, and this is a diagram that shows you how they are very well connected with the hair follicle, produce a lot of oil, oily substance that is uh, uh, lubricating your hair and your skin. Your skin becomes almost like hydrophobic because of all this uh, sebum that is produced constantly. It's very important to protect. Uh, your skin um, and to, to form really an environment also that has a certain pH, okay? Now, this sebum sometimes gets um, gets uh, uh, infected and inflamed, of causing, for instance, acne, or uh, there is if there is an excess of it, it forms here, it kind of plugs everything, and uh, this is an example of a blackhead, okay, where the of the all this sebum okay oxidizes in contact with the hair and becomes black and then becomes like a black head all right so um when we talk about sudoriferous glands or sweat glands there are several types okay there are the apocrine ones and the ectrine ones the apocrine ones are associated with the hair follicle here and these are um where the ectin glands are not associated. See, that's one of the main differences. But one of the main differences is also that these ones are activated puberty. They produce a um, secretion that has an odor. While the ectin glands are pretty much odorless, there's wet glands present pretty much everywhere, all over your body. Mostly, though, concentrated in the palms um, of the hands and the soles of feet. Okay. Um, we also looked at other apocrine glands, which are the, uh, located, it's diff they're different than um, these sweat glands. These apocrine glands in, um, 
breast and also in um, ear, uh, they produce um, pretty much a fatty substance. And uh, these are the mammary glands and the ceruminous glands. These are all uh, the uh, serum, this uh, material that is produced in the ear is, is waxy material, it's hydrophobic, it's always belongs to the same um, pretty much uh, um, class of molecules as lipids, okay? And also here, of course, the fat, all the fat droplets that are released into the milk is all pure fat, okay? These are just, um, I was just kind of presenting to you these other types of glands uh, that are apocrine, okay? But they're not really uh, related to uh, what we're talking about here, the um, skin, basically. All right, so, um, and here's just a diagram that showed you all the various types of glands, pretty easy to recognize here. And we talked about nails, nail tech, uh, soft tissue of fingers and toes from injury and uh, pretty much when you think about a nail you have to think about that stratum corneum you know that becomes so thick and so keratinized basically that it becomes very hard that's what a nail is okay so it's nothing different than what we have already seen so uh, under the nail you'll see all the um, uh, the other uh, layers of skin of the epidermis that um, deep layers of the epidermis that we have looked at, okay, that forms the bed under the skin, okay, under the nail, sorry, under the nail. And uh, the nail matrix is the area where pretty much the cells are dividing and um, is responsible for nail growth. Okay, um, well, we talked about some clinical um, aspects of how to, recognizing, to recognize certain conditions, maybe looking at nails. Okay, remember the spoon nail or the ball lines are important. Okay, and then we, uh, we learn how to recognize signs or skin cancer. I may give you a, an image like this. Okay, yes, it's important. So, um, all right, what time is it? Oh my goodness, it's already. Oh my goodness, it's already 12. Okay, so we have eight minutes. Okay. All right, so. Um, uh, skeletal system, introduction. Let's do the introduction real quick. So, here, of course, you have to know all functions very well, the various, pretty obvious ones. And um, importantly, you have to know how to define the various portions of bones. And uh, remember, we already we, we repeated this. I think it was yet uh, the last time we saw each other. I was asking you how do you, ooh, how do you name uh, the various portions of a long bone, epiphysis, and then this is the shaft. This is the other epiphysis. Don't talk, don't worry about the metaphysis. I don't care about it. The shaft is also known as diaphysis. And remember, in every long bone, we have a cavity. This is not, not, not present in flat bones. A cavity uh, makes the bone lighter and also houses the bone marrow. Okay, that's important. And then the membranes that we find on the bone. Uh, um, periosteum is the one that you find outside. And then... Uh, um, Endosteum is the one that you find between the cavity and the, uh, the uh, bone itself, okay, internally. And in fact, the endosteum, you don't find it in the, um, in the uh, flat bones. One important feature of long bone is the growth plate. This is the plate, this is the, the area where basically um, you have growth and remember that um, after birth your bones still keep growing of course you uh, they have to um, become longer as you grow and they become longer because there is a layer of um, cartilage here that constantly ossifies and this is one of the modality 
through which uh, bone forms, right? And it's actually the major, um, the major way your bones, your bone tissue forms in your body. Uh, anybody remembers how this type of ossification is called? No? Guys, you should already know that, okay? Anyways, this plate, okay, we're going to look at it in a minute again. This plate, after uh, after puberty, or after 20 year old or so, um, becomes a line because, the, uh, because it gets kind of like smashed down and the cartilage uh, disappears, it becomes all bone, and it stops growing. It, it makes sense because at some point the growth has to. Uh, stop. Um, and remember that we find that the articular cartilage uh, and these uh, surround the epiphysis of long bones. And we just saw that, right? We just uh, we just talked about this some 30 minutes ago when we were talking about hailing cartilage, didn't we? See how things are connected here. If you know it from there, you know it here already. Then we talked about the types of cells that we find in uh, bone, the osteocytes. These derive from osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are young osteocytes. They derive from stem cells, and we call them osteoprogenitor cells, the progenitor cells of the osteo, of the bone, basically. And uh, con constantly, uh, they're like uh, the cells in your blood. There are stem cells in your blood, in your uh, bone marrow, they constantly differentiate and become your blood cells. Same thing here, okay? There is a constant differentiation of these uh, progenitor cells into osteoblasts and osteocytes. Osteoblasts make the bone tissue and osteocytes maintain it. And osteocytes are ramified, have cellular processes. Then we talked about the osteoclasts, which are cells that destroy your bone tissue. They produce uh, this uh, acid, okay, hydrochloric acid. That's the best thing you use when you want to dissolve bone, okay? And uh, that these cells are able to produce it and also other enzymes to destroy all the collagen fibers. And uh, this process happens constantly in your, in your body because it's constant remodeling of the bones. And, mono, uh, and uh, the osteoclasts come from a uh, fusion of monocytes, which are basically white blood cells. And at some point, uh, fuse together to form something completely different. They don't have a defense um, function anymore. They just uh, acquire this. Uh, osteoclastic function. We looked at compound versus spongy bone. Remember the structure of compact bone. If you take a section of a compact bone, you see all these circles, right? All these circles are called the osteons or haversian system. In each circle, there is a central canal, okay? And then you see all um, this uh, lamella, kind of lamella structure going concentrically, okay, as shown in this picture. And uh, the central canal is a canal through which uh, blood vessels and nerves go. These canals are also um, connected uh, a um, laterally uh, through other canals, they're known as Workman canals, okay? This is an osteon, okay? This is an osteon. The osteon is defined by the central canal. Every, say, every time you see a central canal, around it is an osteon. And uh, if we uh, zoom in, all these uh, little um, dark dots here are all cell nuclei, are the osteoclast cells, okay? And these osteoclast cells, of course, are accommodated into lacune. Again, we talked about lacune just recently today. And um, and because of the projections of the osteo uh, osteocytes, there is all there are all these canaliculi, okay, canaliculus, singular canaliculi, plural. You can perceive them here. Look, all these little lines here, they are all the canaliculi that accommodate the projections of um, of the uh, osteo osteocytes, and so. Um, 
okay uh, all the uh, all here uh, these structures in between the layers of um the concentric layers of cells these are called lamellae and all in here all your collagen fibers packed packed to form such strong bone okay and calcified so these are known as lamellae all right so you can't go wrong when you look at a picture like this this is compact bone it's very recognizable this is a real uh histology okay this is another uh view of all the osteons okay again again this is a typical uh typical histology of uh, compact bone you have to be able to recognize this for me it's so obvious right it looks like a tree trunk okay all right the spongy bone is a different story it looks like this um and um you see all these trabecule okay um this is a, a um this is not a histology this is really an image an image of a pretty um large uh magnification but it's not a histology this um histology of spongy bone looks like this where you see these uh, pink uh, colored structures are the trabecule and in between here the trabecule of course the spaces are filled with a lot of uh, adipose tissue and bone marrow as well okay and of course if you zoom in more this is higher magnification you're able to appreciate the lacune okay with the osteo uh, with the osteocytes inside so there isn't a, that arrangement in a concentric fashion as you see in the um, um, osteons and in the compact bone but there are still uh, everywhere uh, the lacune and with the uh, osteocytes inside okay uh, we looked about uh, at uh, an osteoporotic type of bone okay and the same thing that you uh, pretty much find in uh, long bones such as um, spongy bone in the middle and compact bone um, outside uh, is found in uh, uh, flat bones you don't have here you don't have a haze inside remember that's typical of the long bones okay you don't have that cavity all right then we looked at ossification this is kind of important i don't mean you to know all this, the minutia here but differences between endochondral and intramembranous ossification i was asking you what kind of ossification happens at those growth plates uh, in the epiphysis of long bones and i didn't get any answer i didn't go look if anybody wrote it down that's the endochondral type of ossification which is a type of, of bone formation that goes through the formation of cartilage first this is the main type of ossification that happens in your body the intramembranous one uh, only really happens uh, mainly in the skull in the intramembranous it's a direct uh, formation of bone okay so intramembranous ossification uh, happens directly from fibrous membranes and only happens in your skull mandible and clavicles everywhere else is uh, the other type of ossification the endochondral okay uh, we looked at the various steps of intramembranous ossification process where first you have that some uh, progenitor cells, the mesenchymal cells, they differentiate into osteoblasts and then uh, the osteoblasts start depositing all the bone fibers. Um, and once a center, um, ossification center has formed, some of the osteoblasts will become osteo, uh, some of the yes, osteoblasts will become osteocytes so you ramified okay and the, the process continues throughout the whole bone okay whereas in the endochondral ossification you have already a bone that is formed that is cartilage and that cartilage remember cartilage is not vascularized at all uh, in that cartilage, um, uh, the chondrocytes start dying out, and a 
Uh, primary ossification center starts forming in the middle of the bone, and this gets vascularized. So again, some um, progenitor cells will start differentiating, depositing uh, bone uh, tissue while the cartilage tissue is actually reabsorbed. And, um, and, and that starts in the middle of the bone. And eventually, other two secondary uh, ossification sensors will, will uh, form the same way uh, in the epiphysis, okay, the extremities of the bone. Okay, so that's, I mean, I don't mean you to know all the details, but major, major uh, steps here, okay, of endochondral and intramembranous ossification, okay? And again, I'm showing you the same picture I showed you just earlier today. Uh, at this epiphyseal plate, that's where uh, your endochondral ossification is happening, okay? You need to know this. If you see a line like this, how old is this person? Go back to... How old is this? 18? I want to say over 20, okay? But 18 is uh, is okay. But this is, um, I may give you a question like this. Like I show you this and say this person is likely to be three year old, 15 year old, 25 year old, you know, something like that. Okay. So you have to know why, uh, how you can guess. It's already 12, uh, 12 16. Anyways, um, yeah, then there is the positional growth, there is a thickness, growing thickness, and the bone remodeling is very important. Who is involved in bone remodeling? Osteoclasts and osteoblasts, because osteoclasts have to destroy and liquefy really, that bone tissue thanks to the production of HCL, okay, and many enzymes. Uh, and therefore, they can mobilize all the calcium. When we study, um, Muscular tissue, you'll understand how important is that calcium, okay, and your uh, the movement of your muscles. All right, so I pretty much I am going to stop here, okay, for today for review. Uh, the skeletal system pretty much is something that we done very recently, so I'm hoping that you know you remember that one a little bit better. Now it's a lot of material, guys, but you signed up for a hard class. I know. So just study very intensely. If you have any question, Jose, I told you this. Jose is asking what chapters of the PowerPoints are going to be next. Okay. Let me answer again this question. I talked about it in the beginning. I'm going to uh, open up Blackboard. Okay and show you uh, in your blackboard, okay? There is unit two, right? So you go in your blackboard, you go onto the lecture PowerPoints, you open up unit two, all the lectures of unit two are going to be on material of the exam. Okay, from the lecture number one, which is the second part of the tissues, we just looked at it today, until appendicular skeleton, which we actually finished today. The question? One quick question. Yes. Um, I don't really understand the, the hand and balloon model of the brains, and I was just wondering if you could go over that just really quickly. Yeah, that should be easy. Okay. Let's see. It's very easy. Try it at home. Okay. Take a balloon and fill it uh, um, there, not too much with air, That, but that air should be really water. If you fill it up with water, it may not work. This kind of tissue and nervous. Yeah, no, we don't we don't do any muscle tissue or nervous tissue in this uh, section. I even told you I'm not even going gonna give you any question about the function of muscle tissue. That is something presented in one of these PowerPoints. I told you, don't worry, I'm not giving you any question. Okay. All right. So the balloon model. Just a second. Where was it? Uh, 
it was here issues and let's open the image so really if you can get a balloon and try this um open it up um there you go i'm sorry i am not showing uh, sharing my um powerpoint yes the skin is going to be on the test it's there all the uh not the epithelial tissues not the epithelial tissues but the skin yeah so the epithelial tissues we it was part of unit one so no but the skin yes i don't know if you intended what you intended okay so um here is the image of the balloon okay so imagine to put your hand in this balloon that is very likely um, filled with air, not too much, okay? What happens is that, um, really do it practically, maybe that makes you understand. Your hand is going to be in contact with these, uh, these, uh, sorry, let me take it. these layer of the balloon okay now it's one balloon it's one uh, membrane okay but it has two layers so once you put your fist in there you will recognize two layers one layer touches your fist now the other layer does not touch your feet there is air in between here right the other layer does not touch your feet and so a uh, fist so this layer that is outside is the parietal, is the wall, whereas the layer of the balloon that touches your fist is going to be your visceral. And that's exactly what a, a serous membrane looks like. We have the parietal uh, uh, section and the visceral, the visceral section, which is a section that touches your organ, okay? Try it at home. I really I guarantee you, if you do it, you will understand it um, practically. Thank you. Did it help? Does it help? Yes, definitely. I think I was just getting confused on all the different layers, but now that I understand all the different layers, I think it's a lot more clear. So uh, somebody is asking, Ralph is asking, what about the lab? Same thing. And so the labs that are associated with uh, all the um, practical things that are associated with the lectures. So expect some um, to identify some of the connective tissues, starting from connective tissues, and then all the uh, all the lab uh, practicals, all the practical things that we have done with. Um, a basically person uh, mastering AMP, starting from uh, the integumentary system and then all the skeletal system, uh, the joints, all what we have done, okay? With mastering AMP, all those uh, things, uh, review them. Um, I may take some images from uh, mastering for, um, you know, for the test just to identify you know, snapshot, what's in there. You're welcome, Brianna. Multiple choice, yes, it's not gonna be anything to write. Multiple choice. How many diagrams are coming in the test? You mean figures to recognize? Uh, a good a good 50% probably of the tests are going to be figures. Hopefully, there won't be too much because I know when uh, um, you start putting too many figures in the test, it becomes very heavy and the program may not you know, upload them or something. So I have to, um, maybe no more than 50%. Yeah, I don't want to go there. Okay. All right, guys, uh, if you have questions or concerns or you, you know, even want to 
personal go some over something that you didn't understand just email me okay i'm available certain times of course and um yeah you um you have time okay the test is on monday so you have many days to consolidate your studies okay repeat things um many things overlap after you after you complete your study you'll realize how many of these things that we have done actually overlap all right so i'm gonna i'm gonna go